I was sitting in a train and I saw a Jew, somebody with a couple, a yarmulke, across from me sitting in a train, reading something. And um, I was just mesmerized. I, I watched him and I really wanted to ask him for guidance, but I was too shy and it was uh, rush hour, the train was full, whatever. I was on my way to work. He was on his way somewhere. I just decided I'm going to follow him off the train. And when the opportunity is there, I will uh, ask him. So um, he got off at Wall Street. I passed my stop that I had to get off and followed him off the train at Wall Street. And when he was standing on the escalator, everything was quiet. Everybody seemed to mind their own business. So I tucked on his sleeve. I didn't know really you know, how, how else to kind of get his attention without getting everybody else's attention around me. So I tucked on his sleeve. He was just bewildered and looked at me like, what do you want? And I explained to him, like, hey, I just came from Holland, I'm Jewish, and I would like to learn more to, more about it. Do you know where I could go, what I could do, who I could call? Welcome back to another episode of Inspiration for the Nation. I'm always looking for those people, those Jews around the world that are doing incredible things. Sometimes you know who they are, you know about them, and sometimes you don't know who they are, but you... You hear about their story and they're so intriguing. I was perusing around YouTube and this wonderful YouTube channel uh, created by Frida Wiesel. I don't know if I'm pronouncing her name properly, but she interviewed Suri, who you're going to see me interview. Um, their video has over half a million views. And I said, this is someone who is an inspiration for the nation. She did not grow up uh, religious. She grew up Jewish. She's Clearly, as you'll see, she's uh, a black person and she decided to become Hasidish. I, what? Who becomes, when someone comes from, like how often are they becoming Hasidish? Suri has a wild story and her resilience is really, really powerful. This episode is in memory of Shimon David ben Yaakov Shleima, as well as Miriam Sara as Yaakov Moshe, as well as Simcha Beryl David ben Avram Moshe. And you will hear about three incredible people or companies that are supporting this podcast. You're going to hear about the Simcha Time Revolution, which you've been hearing me knock about for a while because they deserve all the attention in the world. You're going to hear about an incredible, incredible campaign to help spread learning Torah, Biritzifus, which means just nonstop, just learn, 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 and how you could be a part of that. I'm so excited to tell you about that. And you're going to hear about one of my favorite podcasts to listen to, the Good Faith Effort Podcast. Now, without further ado, my conversation with Suri. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Okay, here I am with Sar Braun. Sar or Sarah? That's first of all. No, we really say Suri, but... Suri? Yeah, but, you know, on my birth certificate, it's Sarah. <laughs> Got it. Okay, I'll call you Suri if that works. So here with Suri Braun, we're speaking, I feel like I'm in Holland. Is that where you're calling from? Yes. Okay, but it feels like we're in the same room. Um, and okay, we're here to talk about, obviously, what brought you to write your book um, and I guess your story. So could you take us back to what your childhood was like? My childhood... Um, I grew up in the Netherlands, in a, in a very rural area in the Netherlands. It's called the Beemster. Um, a lot of windmills, a lot of farms, a lot of farm farm animals. We had some animals. I was I would wear wooden shoes when I would play outside, um, not to school. <laughs> Um, Hold on, you're saying wooden shoes as if like that's a regular, like what What does that mean? Who wears wooden <laughs> shoes? Is that a thing? Yes, it's like clogs. It, it, it's a Dutch um, cultural thing. Mm. Today, not many people wear it. But when I was younger, where I'm from, um, yes, many people would wear that. Um, yeah, it was just very safe, extremely safe. I would walk outside as a toddler by myself. That's normal. There would always be somebody else watching uh, the children, keeping an eye on everything. Everybody knew each other. Um, I have uh, two brothers and one older sister. I am the youngest. And uh, I, yeah, I, I was raised by my parents. Um, very loving, soft, bubbly mother and a very strict father. Um, 
I was and still am today extremely close to my mother. And my mother is Jewish, my father is not. And um, I was not really raised with the Jewish religion. Um, as you can see, I'm a person of color. <laughs> and so is my mother. I don't see color, so I didn't <laughs> notice that. But now that you say it, okay, well, fine. <laughs> um, but my, my, my mother's uh, grandmother was, was uh, uh, yeah, a Jewish lady with green eyes, gray green eyes and uh, light complexion. And uh, my, my mother was very much discriminated against by her own grandmother. So she never felt that she should follow the Jewish religion in, in her mind. Jews were. Well, take, take me back a little. Meaning you're, you're both your parents are of color? Yes. Got it. Okay. So both of your parents are of color. At what point was like, I mean, you said you're saying now you're, uh, is it your great grandmother? My great grandmother. Yes. So your great grandmother was white? Jewish. In Holland, Jewish is not considered white, but in America, I guess it is. So yeah. She was, she was Jewish. I mean, meaning was she of color? No, my great grandmother, no. No, but her was her daughter of yes. color? Like at what point was what did your family look different than the average Hasidish family? Uh, starting with my grandmother, really. Your yeah. grandmother. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay, so like what's what's the story there? I mean, my family's on, on my mother's side is the type of family um in any case with kind of like secrets. I pretty much recently found out that my great grandmother's mother I believed at slaves. This was never to, you know, my, 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 my mother's family likes to hold secrets and whatever, everything is a secret. Um, but to my understanding, she was um, married to a butcher who was also uh, of color, um, who had a lot of money. Um, and, and, and so she was with him and all her kids came out pretty much looking like her, light complexion, lighter colored eyes. I did some that didn't have lighter eyes, except for my grandmother. My grandmother came out pretty dark. So, and now also recently I learned that my great grandmother was fourth to give my grandmother away to her father's side of the family. Um, uh, and the butch the butcher was a Jewish no. person as well? Uh, he, he, no, was, he was not. But partially, you know. Interesting. Um, okay. He was Jews by, Jewish by law, but not by blood, if you will. Um, I got it. Okay. So, um, so like he more associated with Judaism, I guess. He had a Jewish mother, but not a father, or something like that. He wants okay. Jewish. He was okay. Jewish. Then I guess he's Jewish. His last name right. also was Jewish, but I, I, I don't know exactly uh, how that is. This is just what was told to me. Right. You're like, hey, I'm just here. I have no clue exactly how I <laughs> got it. And what I right. had to prove that I was Jewish, I only had to look into the mother line of the family anyway. So I never really looked at that, that, that side. Right. Right. Um, right. But, uh, yeah. So, um, it was a person of color also. Um, and all the kids came out white except for my grandmother and she was given away because of her dark complexion. Ah, uh, and, um, yeah, she had my mother and uh, my aunt. And um, when she was she 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 was dying at a pretty young age, when my mother was five, um, and when she was dying, my great grandmother claimed the custody of my mother and my aunt. So my mother was raised by her Jewish grandmother, but but not with love, I guess maybe with love, but with not with love. It's interesting because, like, you, you know, I think today the world is just a lot more, I guess, open-minded and we're just more with it and, like, just we value or we we don't value things that, like, are just not an, a, important. And, you know, but back then it wasn't, I guess, is more, I don't even know. I'm not giving her an excuse, but, like, what, what do you think it was? It was, like, more taboo oh. to have a child of color? Certainly. In Certainly. Um, it definitely was. I, I, I mean, I still remember myself the the, um, uh, the 
the, the split in the family, the diversity, you know, between me and my lighter skinned cousins and how my great grandmother would really prefer them over me and my siblings, how they were allowed to attend certain family events and we were not because we were darker. I still remember as well. And today when I, um, when I am among other Yiddish people, Jewish Hasidic people, certain, um, certain ages are more accepting of a different type of Jew like myself than other age groups. You, you even notice it today, kind of like how certain people are warmer than other people. But yeah, back in the day, it definitely was more taboo, more um, what would the people say? What would, you know, my mother say, my, my uh, community say? Yeah, it was definitely more of a problem, I would say. I imagine that was very challenging for you and your siblings to have a grandmother that like openly was just giving more favor towards your cousins and, and people not of color. And I, like, how did that play a role in like, I guess your confidence and your siblings' confidence? Well, to be really honest, I was showered with so much love from my mother, literally just wow. drowning in it that I never really felt my confidence for sure that was never um, touched by my great grandmother at all. And as a child, I, I didn't really notice. Now I'm older, I realized, oh yeah, that was not okay. That was not cool. Um, and at some point, my mother kept us away from her because she did not want us to be exposed to that. Um, but I, I was really raised with tremendous love by, a, in my opinion, a very powerful woman. Um, and for me, just the fact that I come from my mother, that woman, was for me just everything. There was no way that anyone could convince me of any different, that I would be less of, of than anyone else or anything, just because of the example that my mother set. Yeah. And, and I guess take me back, like you were going to Hasidic, Hasidic schools then, or there was a shift at a certain point that you're like, hey, I want to become more from more <laughs> orthodox as time went on. No, I did not go to Hasidic schools at all. As a child, I did not want people really to know that, that I was Jewish at all. It was not a cult Jewish. Mm -hmm. It was not. I literally thought that we were the only Jews in the world. And I thought that Jews are just not favorable, not pleasant, depressing, sad, like mean, you know, that was the idea that I I had. Um, and unfortunately, in, in, in where I grew up, that's kind of how it was presented to me as well, that, that Jews are just really no good people. And I, there was no way that I, I, I wanted Christmas. I thought Christmas was beautiful. I actually still think Christmas songs are beautiful songs. I like music. Um, but um, that's that's really what I wanted to focus on. Nobody should know. I should not get teased. We had a Jewish boy in, in school. He got really uh, bullied tremendously. I didn't want that. Um, and um, yeah, my mother was not really into it either. So we know um the jewish part really came much later when we moved to amsterdam that's when i got exposed more to other jews we, we literally moved to the smack middle of the jewish neighborhood ironically and that's how that's really when i was thinking like oh they don't the kids don't really look so so depressed and sad and so interesting that there are <laughs> more jews like around i I literally thought that th there's none, maybe in Israel, but for the rest, really, you know. Um, so that's kind of where my mind already started shifting. Then when I went to New York at age 18, like a whole other world opened in regards to uh, the Jewish world, if you, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> What was your goal? Like, why why did you come to New York? Were you were you looking to grow spiritually? Were you looking for a job? Like, what? brought you to um, New York? So when I was 14, we went to New York on vacation and I just fell in love with the city. I, I am a, I am a, from 
by nature, I'm a very vibrant person. I have a lot of energy. I like to do things. And and I just fell in love with New York City. And I just had nothing really to do with Judaism, really. Um, I just wanted to be there. I wanted to go there. To me, Holland was boring, slow, sad. I just didn't want it to be here. So um, when I was 18, two weeks after my 18th birthday, I went, I, I, I left for New York. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you get to New York and, and uh, tell us about your experience and like what led you to just be like, I want to be a Hasidish oh, no. Jew. Like how you got to that <laughs> it point. It didn't go like that. <laughs> Okay, so let me first of all back up. The last time when I saw my great-grandmother, she was actually very nice to me for the first time. I never really remembered her being warm and nice. That last time, she was extremely warm and nice. She put her arm around me and she spoke to me in Yiddish. She was explaining to me, you know, even though I didn't always was very nice, I'm Jewish. Uh, you are Jewish also. You should never forget that you're Jewish. And she started selling me tales about her um, parents, et cetera, et cetera, and, and her Hasidic background. It didn't mean much to me back then. I really, I, it, I felt uncomfortable. I just wanted to be let go of and continue to play with my cousin. Um, but she said that, and it always just kind of stuck with me. When I got to New York, I did want to do something more about our, with, with, with Judaism, you know. I wanted to dive more into it. I was looking for, searching for something. Um, so I, I was sitting in a train and I saw a Jew, somebody with a kapel, a yarmulke, across from me sitting in a train, reading something. And um, I was just mesmerized. I, I watched him and I really wanted to ask him, for guidance, but I was too shy and it was uh, rush hour, the train was full, whatever. I was on my way to work. He was on his way somewhere. I just decided I'm going to follow him off the train. And when the opportunity is there, I will uh, ask him. So um, he got off at Wall Street. I passed my stop that I had to get off and followed him off the train at Wall Street. And when he was standing on the escalator, everything was quiet. Everybody seemed to mind their own business. So I talked on his sleeve. I didn't know really, you know, how, how else to kind of get his attention without getting everybody else's attention around me. So I talked on his sleeve. He was just bewildered and looked at me like, what do you want? And I explained to him like, hey, I just came from Holland. I'm Jewish and I would like to learn more, to, more about it. Do you know where I could go, what I could do, who I could call? Then he started asking me a whole bunch of questions about my Jewish background, etc. My mother, my grandma, my great grandma, and how and who and what and where and where did you get your color from, really? Um, and I answered all the questions. They were only fair, I guess. Um, and then he said, okay, fine, give me your number and let me look into this for you. I gave him my number, but I really didn't expect to hear from him. Um, and really shortly after, I was sitting by the water at Battery Park and he called me. Nafi, sorry, the rabbi, a rabbi called me. The rabbi explained that he got my number from a gentleman that I um, yeah, approached at the train station. And the rabbi too started to ask me uh, a lot of questions. And I guess when he was satisfied, he um, told me about this organization on the Upper West Side that <clears throat> perhaps I should visit, I should look into. It's for beginners uh, that uh, want to learn more about Judaism. So... Um, I started, <laughs> I started going there, and there was an, a whole different community of Jews that I never knew even existed, like young and modern and in jeans and just very outspoken and just very happy and just intelligent, and I was just completely in awe. And I really still walked in there like a typical girl that's not from New York, so I where are you from? Where are you from? Where are you from? What is this? I was wearing a checkered skirt and a turtleneck or something. So I started to go there. I started to, to attend to a shooting and um, uh, the events that they had. Sometimes I would go for Shabbos. And um, so I learned more and more. And at some point with my very broken English, they asked me to work for them as well. I was <laughs> like, sure. Um, I started working for them. And as I worked there, people started calling in 
with all sorts of questions. Like I just, uh, a beginners like myself, like I just, uh, rented this apartment. How do I cash in my kitchen? Or I just got a new apartment. How do I hang up the mezissa? Questions like that. And because of all those questions, and I was the first person that picked up the phone, I too started to learn more and more and more and more and grow more and more and more religious. Then I met this friend. Um, she lived in Manhattan, but she had family in Brooklyn, Hasidic family in Brooklyn. Uh, and she was a bit of a mod, a little bit um, um, interesting, call it that. She had all these extreme ways about her. Um, and she asked me one day if I wanted to go to Brooklyn with her to bake cookies. And I was just enthusiastic because I used to bake a lot in Europe. And, you know, in New York, in my head, nobody bakes. Everybody just buys things like right there <laughs> available. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. That's a fair call. America just yeah. as a whole, we, we, we spend a lot more money than yeah, we should. Yeah, so when I first arrived there, you can get anything like a few blocks away. In Holland, you can't, you know. I mean, back then. When I was younger, you definitely couldn't. So I was like, okay. Anyway, I went to her, to Brooklyn, to her um, aunt's house to bake cookies. Now her aunt was uh, square, British, um, and I clicked really well with it. And I just, it's something clicked in my head as well. I felt an instant like feeling of home, of, 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 uh, of a settlement. Yeah, yeah. Belonging. So, um, and... Her aunt actually thought I was very uncomfortable and everything was new to me and, you know, which was interesting. And I was a little bit offended by that because I felt like because I'm dark, you think I'm uncomfortable, whatever. So I started going there more often and often. I got along really well with her family. Um, and I just unconsciously, really not intentionally, unconsciously really grew more and more religious in the meantime, I was still working in Manhattan. And um, sometimes we would have uh, like big Shabbos dinners, right? For 100 people. And for the Shabbos dinners, we used to cater. And this caterer had a mashkiach. A mashkiach is somebody who oversees the kitchen when food is being cooked for, for it to be kosher for whatever. And this mashkiach was was the sat murder, uh, Chusit. Very soft, like a very jolly guy. Very loud, very... Very, very uh, Hasidic. I became very friendly with him. He spoke Yiddish. It made me feel comfortable. And we became very close friends. He lives in Brooklyn. Um, at some point, I also moved to Brooklyn. I just felt more at home there than in New York. And uh, sometimes he would, he was dating somebody, um, a friend of mine. And we would sometimes take walks on Ocean Parkway and just schmooze and whatever. And at some point, he stopped dating this lady and we sometimes still took walk I, I was 20 years older than me so i had no intention of dating him at all we were just friends he asked me at some point how i was thinking about how i felt about the idea of maybe dating him and then i said no and then he got insulted but that's another story <laughs> oh yeah. wow okay oh that was funny so um um at some point he asked me if I would like to come with him to a uh, uh, Rebbe Shechassen. His Rebbe's, his Rebbe's youngest daughter was getting married in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. So first I said, no, that made me uncomfortable. I felt like, what, what am I going to do there? I didn't get an invitation. I back then thought that you would get an invitation to go to these weddings. Of course you don't. But <laughs> just... Yeah. Oh, so you probably thought there's a lot less people by <laughs> that type of wedding. So people would like yeah. instantly be like, oh my gosh, who is this person? We didn't invite her. Get out That's of here. exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> yeah. But it's usually to a wedding. Also, you get some sort of invitation. Yeah. I didn't get anything. They didn't even know about my existence. Why would I go to that wedding? But uh, he was really like, ah, you should go. Don't worry. Everybody's going, nobody got an invitation. Just go. And, and it, it, to a certain level, I was curious also to, uh, you know, to go. So he, I decided to go. He was on the men's side. I didn't see him all night, of course. I was on the women's side. <clears throat> 
So um, I was approached very quickly by by women to figure out what are you doing here? Who are you? Not that blunt, of course, but I was surrounded by a group of women and they came and they started asking me questions. Uh, Mazel tov. So what's your name? Do you live here? Who do you know? And et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I felt a little bit like really none of your business, none of your business, none of your business. So I started to kind of answer in uh, circles just to, uh, you know, spike up the curiosity and to just really to, to be a little bit, uh, you know, how you say it. You could say in Yiddish and I could try translating it. Not that I know <laughs> um, Yiddish well. You're d- trying to be dismissive. You're not trying to give them right, any answers. Exactly. None of their business. It's a little bit like, you know, you have no right asking these questions. Um, so at some point, one of the ladies asked me finally, like, you are Jewish, right? And then I answered back in Yiddish. Yiddish. I was the Yiddish. You know, that means like, of course I'm Jewish. Why are you asking me? Are you Jewish? Of course I knew why they asked me. But hmm. just to play dumb. Uh, <laughs> and then the eyes was <laughs> broken. They were like, oh. <laughs> and then they started to go around to get more people to beat me. And wow. And so that's the Zayriki Yiddish and whatever. Um, and then all of a sudden it was like um, uh, a full uh, acceptance. Like, like, you know, very kind, nice, warm and everything. Um, then we had the Chupa ceremony. And during all this, I met this one lady. Um, she was about a little older than me, about my age, maybe a few of, but at the most four years older than me. Um, after the chuppah ceremony, she took me to her house because she had to feed her baby. Um, and we started talking. And during this conversation, she said to me, "You know what? Um, you should, you should, you should go to the other um, Satma Rebetzin in." in in Monroe, not to this one. I think the other one you would like more. Uh, you know, Sapmed is split kind of into. Um, so I, I didn't exactly know what was going on back then, um, but she said that, and I was like, well, I'll look into it. I was just curious. Um, during the, the dancing of the wedding, I was staring at all over again, and from a distance, and you saw people like you literally could feel the gossiping. <laughs> Um, until the Lebsons came to me from across the room, literally, to, to, to dance with me. When she did that, it seems like everybody was like, oh, okay, if the Lebson dances with her, it should be fine. And then I got respect again, yeah? And um, during the mitzvah times, um, then I, 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 it was pretty much clear and obvious, like, Mazel Tov, okay, we know who you are, it's okay, Mazel Tov, Mazel Tov. I left early because I started to get dizzy at some point. During the mitzvah times, we were all like on top of each other. I I left. So, um, but yeah, it, it was a it was a beautiful experience, but very intense experience, extremely intense. Okay, we will be back to this week's episode and stick around. There are some wild moments from her life that I'm like, is this is this even happening? What what a person with so much resilience that is the word. But I want to tell you about your next best opportunity. Okay, there's a program called Masika Satora. If you ever learned any Torah, if you ever studied for anything in your life, you've noticed that the more you focus and don't get interrupted by your phone, by schmoozing, by talking to others, you could accomplish what you're studying. So when it comes to studying Torah, it is so easy to talk to your friend that you're studying with, that you're learning with about sports or about that crazy thing that happened by breakfast or the the the, the song that you just heard last night that you love, or you talk to the guy walking by and you check your phone because you got a text message. It happens. If anyone who has been successful in life knows the fact the key to success is being focused. And there's this idea in the Jewish world called Ritzifas. I'm sure it's out there in the world also of just constant focus and uninterruption. So what happens is, and it happens in a lot of yeshivas, people do Ritzifas, right? They focus and focus and focus. I've done it in my, say, for the next three hours, we're not talking about anything besides the Torah, about the, the Gemara, whatever we're learning at that moment. And I could... The the learning that we've got, the amount we have accomplished in those three hours was so different than me 
learning for five minutes and then interrupted and 15 minutes and interruption. Even if I did 10 hours, but with interruption is not the same as three hours as uninterrupted. And imagine five hours uninterrupted, 30 minutes uninterrupted. Now, Masika Satara is going ahead and helping support the people, the Bakram, the younger light that are learning Beritsifas. It, it's, it's, and wonderful. It's 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 crazy. The amount of people learning Torah today is 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 unbelievable. We never had anything like this. But we're trying to really hone in on the quality of the Torah that is lear- being learned. So there are people who are saying, you know what? I love Torah. I love learning, and I want to help others learn Beritifas, and I want them to get rewarded. I want them to get compensated for doing that. It's really not easy, and it's so hard to focus and do it. So. So Masika Satara is basically going around. It's a program. It's incredible. And they're rewarding and they're they're giving an incentive for people to do Ritzifas and learn without interruption. And you have the opportunity to be a part of the ship. There's 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 a concept in, in Judaism called Yisachar Zvulun. There's two brothers, Jacob's brother, Jacob's sons, Yaakov's sons, that they, one of them learned and one of them supported his learning. One of them was the person of commerce and he was uh, did a, a lot of deals with ships. And he went on ships, I think. I mean, that's his image. But he went ahead and helped the study of Torah. And they supported each other. They said, hey, my level of Torah learning is going to be part of yours. Even though you're not learning, it's yours because you're helping support me. So you could do that. Even if you're learning or even if you're not learning, you say, hey, I want to be a part of this magic. The, the, the world, one of the things the world stands on is Torah. Torah learning. If there wasn't a moment of Torah learning going on, the world would cease to exist and you could help the world spin round and round and round. And more than that, you could help people look into the world, look into the blueprint of the world without any interruption and you could be a part of that. So you can be a part of it. They've already distributed over a million dollars. So for just $30 a month, that's not a lot of money or 360 a year, and you could be a part of something. But more than that, Rav Yisrael Newman, Rav David Kain, Rav Elia Ber Wachtvogel, Rav Shleim Afayvel Shustel will daven during the Shemon Esrei for your personal bakasha or request. You're having a few of the holiest people in the world that are going to be davening to Hashem and saying, hey, you know Shimon? He is supporting people learning Torah, Beritzifas, without, in, without interruption, with focus. And he cares about your children. He cares about the world. Please, Hashem, help this person with whatever challenge they're going through. But there's more. You could be mentioned in Ashmanas uh, Gadala, but for an extra close, if you donate $30 before May 24th, Rip Shimon Galai will give a heartfelt bracha and be mispala on Erev Shavuos for your personal bakasha. Again, we believe the world is run by God and God is someone who looks for people who look after his children. More than that, he loves the people who are learning and looking after his children like these great gedolim. So you could be a part of the magic of uh, Masika Satora. It's a wonderful program. And I-, I would say, just try it out. Try it out. Try it out. You want to do the full thing, 360? Boom. That's your one of your tickets into Olam Haba, into heaven. But if you want to try it for, 30, for, for a month, Give thirty dollars. Try it out, and you will see. You will see the incredible, incredible change that is happening in your personal life and in the change of so many people's lives. So you can either call up to donate and give money there at seven three two eight zero zero nine zero nine nine, or you could donate online at masikasatora dot org. That is M E S I K U S H A T O R A H dot org. Like always, the links will be in the show notes please go ahead and support the people who support this podcast so you can listen to a free podcast every single week with the world's most incredible people. Now, back to this week's episode. So at what point did you, I guess, become Hasidish, become officially Officially orthodox? orthodox. Oh, I think when I moved to Brooklyn, really. I, I lived in Manhattan on the Upper East Side and... The last, I would say, six months of living in Manhattan, I already started to feel out of place. I still worked for the same organization. The rabbi was modern Orthodox, but the people that go there uh, ranged anywhere from Reform to modern Orthodox. And I came there like really in full gear, old-fashioned, Bora Park type of Shabbos gear, making the children the giggle before, and just I felt like it was not my crowd, not my community really anymore. So I moved to Brooklyn, and, and, and that's really when I 
completely absorb myself in, in, in that world fully. Yeah. D did you ever consider, um, as you were becoming more observant, um, I guess different sects of of orthodoxy, whether modern orthodox or litvish? Did you, did you ever think like, oh, maybe I would fit in more there, or was it more? Hey, between the Yiddish but, and yeah. the background, where I'm from, Holland, becoming so Hasidic just makes more sense. That asked me that question, and it's such a good question, I must say. Yeah, because oh, I you. must say, in different aspects of my life and of my way of thinking, I fit really in different, as you call them, sects or communities. Yeah, it, it, in terms of really um, upbringing of my children and and. The speaking of Yiddish and the way I cook, the way I prepare Shabbos, the, the way we roll Shabbos, really, I would say definitely Hasidish. But how I dress, I like to, I, 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 I like to dress according to my age. I don't like to, I do feel like, um, in, in Southerners specifically, um, girls, 20 year old girls sometimes tend to dress like babies, like, like older, like like too old, you know. I I don't like that. I do like to. I'm always modest, but I do like to dress like refreshing, like the age that I am. Um. So I, I would say that's not very Hasidic, but rather more. Uh, yeah. What whatever. Modern or the doctorate fish. I don't know. Hmm. So it really depends, really on 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 where you go with it. I would really kind of fit in everywhere. I would say. <laughs> And what what's what um, dynasty of of Hasidic Hasidic background did you are you Bells? You become Satmer? Wh which one did you fall under or I go or choose? I wouldn't say. I I I don't like to label myself really in that way. Uh, okay, so you're you say you're Hasidic, but if someone says who's your Rebbe, you'd be like, I have a few. Pretty much the answer I like the most. No, I'm joking. Okay. I was joking. <laughs> no, so my great grandmother is Bells. Yeah. But, oh, your um, bells! Oh, got it. I I, I do Officially. must say, um, many of my really closest friends happen to be bells, but um, um, I, I don't necessarily consider myself bells. I don't really consider myself satan. But also, many things I do are not accepted in, in satan. Um, and, and when 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 it was time for my kids to go to Heide to a Jewish school, they were all confused. All the schools they were like, "Nah, you're too Hasidic." The, the yeshivas you have to do them were like now you're 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 too um, uh, the Hasidic chadurim would be like you're too yeshivish you're too modern but the Hasidic yeshivas were like you're too too um, um, Hasidic so it was nobody really could 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 place me also it's 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 hard to 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 be do you feel like any of your challenge with Getting your children into yeshivas had to do with the color of your skin, or sure. was it more just about your observance levels? Sure, sure. Well, mostly <laughs> because nobody really knows who this person is. I come from Holland, which is not really, you know, a very Yiddish place in the first place compared to Borupark, com compared to Antwerp, and you know. So that that was one. I have no family in in, in Brooklyn, Borough Park, as far as I know. So nobody, I, I don't really have the background that, that most uh, families have in Brooklyn that, that validates their s status in, in the community. I, I, I didn't have that. I'm just this random person who says she's Jewish, lives in Brooklyn and wants to enroll her kids in, in these schools. They, they have no clue what to think of me, which is fair. I know you're no longer married, but um, what, your, where, what's your husband's background and... What what is I guess if you could quickly give us a glance of like his story, I'm not even sure. Is it a person of color? Is 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 he a, a Balchuva? Is he from from birth? So his background is his father is like Polish and from Antwerp, and his mother is French. He's Jewish also. Um, his family is not religious. Also, after the war, they completely like turned it back to religion. Um, he became Balchuva. Um, but really to, to, to get married to me. Um, and one of the reasons that we were the, we are divorced is also because he really stepped back from Yiddish guy. It wasn't as important to him as to me, which, 
you know, it just got the, the gap got mm -hmm. too big. And there were a few other things which I, for his, um, to respect out of him, I'm not gonna say it. But, um, yeah, we just, mm -hmm. it, it, it just was too much, too much of, uh, yeah, but he's a good parent. How many children, how many children do you guys have? I have three kids, three boys. Three boys. Wow. Nainara. And what, what are the ages? So my oldest, he is 12, almost 13. Then I have Moishi, he's 11. And then I have Maya, he's nine. Wow. Okay. Bar Mitzvah coming up. So that's exciting. I don't even. <laughs> yes, it is. So he's tall as me. He's incredible. It's just what was what what was your I guess your your mother or maybe even father or siblings' reaction as you became more Hasidish? Were they more supportive and saying, "Hey, you're going closer to our heritage somewhat," or were they more like, "Listen, we didn't grow up that way. Like, what are you doing?" Yes. So my mother, very interesting. She was kind of like. Um, um, two extremes. She was like, okay, if this is what you're going to do, you can't go back. That was really her first reaction, which I would never expect from her. Um, but at the same time, she's like, don't let anyone control you. I was really raised to be like, you know, girl power and you're, 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 you can do whatever you want and be whatever you, whoever you want. That's how she raised me. And um, obviously, in our communities, we have a Rebbe and, and you pretty much do what's expected of you to do. But she's very, don't let anyone tell you what to do. So she, she was very much, she's very much like that. Um, and she experienced that also, I must say, when she came to New York to visit us, she walks in the street. She had, she, she got hit on a lot by being Hasidic and married people, a lot. Um, so she really feels like, it's often a facade, like that people act to be so holy and don't let it get to you. You just stay true to yourself. Um, so she had those two, those two uh, um, extremes to her about it. My sister was kind of neutral, like whatever. And um, my, my oldest brother also, but my other brother, the one I came right after, he's just like, why? What, why? He really... Um, consciously also remembered my our great grandmother and how discriminating she was and the things that came out of her mouth it really stuck with him he's the one of our siblings that really remembers everything from our past always and that's one of the things and he's just really like whatever you will never be part of them anyways he, he says that um but he's respectful of it he's respectful he came to my wedding and you know, he, he dressed nicely. He did wear his head covering, and he he, he was respectful. And uh, respectful. and yeah. what about your your father? Did did he not have as much of a role in your life at that point? I was never close to my father. Since I was a child, I ne really never was. Um, my father is a very strict man. Was now he's in a wheelchair. Um, a very strict, and we collided a lot. Like. I was very outgoing, very uh, did whatever I wanted, wouldn't really listen to him. And um, my mother praised that kind of, and my father always tried to have this power, like, no, do this, don't come inside, you cannot go outside, and I would run away, things like that. We never, we were never close. Um, and right now, he had a stroke a few years ago, so right now, never, he's not really in his right state of mind now anywhere. She can't hold a long, um, good conversation with him, too much or whatever. So, you know, I, I guess you had all the cards against you with, you know, your mother kind of being like, you know, unfortunately having a negative experience and, and I guess running into uh, the, the few bad apples in the batch. Um, or, or just your own challenges of, of sometimes feeling like you don't fit in. What part of Judaism or Hasidic Judaism, whatever it is, like drew you so much? Like I, I could kind of understand your brother of saying like, hey, what are you doing? Like, why does this make sense? Like what part of you was like fighting back and like, no, I love this. Like what, what drew you? It's in my heart. It is in my heart. As cheesy as it sounds, it's not that I decide like, hey, I want to become Hasidish. 
It's not like that. If it's easier not to be Hasidish, really, it's much easier not to be Hasidish. I live that life much easier. But it's something really deep inside. It's, it's, it's truly who I am and what I am. It has nothing to do with my skin color. It has nothing to do with whichever rabbi says, what whatever community says. Nobody can tell me anything. This is really just how it is. It is it is how it is. And it's I can't explain it really in words. I can't. It's it's it is just inside. It's in my heart. Yeah. It's really beautiful. And and, and I'll add to that question that the fact that like, you know, you, you've gone through a lot of challenges to get to where you are. But I imagine, you know, as you were going through your divorce, like emotionally, how is it for you of like with your connection to Hashem that like you're trying to connect and grow and grow your family? And then as that's happening, you know, your husband is, is you know, pulling back and, and you know, whatever, you know, right. just doing his own thing. How did that make you feel, I guess, with your connection to Hashem at that point? Well, besides that, I, I could kind of deal with that enough sins. I don't know how to say enough sins in, in English. Uh, somewhat. But there was more to it that was that I was not aware of before the chasana. Mm -hmm. I have one autistic son and he, he, there were things that I didn't know of and just everything together, it was just better for me to get divorced. So young enough to still get remarried. It's better to be happy for another 50, 60 years than to be unhappy for another 50, 60 years. What, was it hard to make that decision or once it was clear that you'll live a happier life separated? Of course, it was hard. You know, you marry with the intention to stay married forever and we have kids together. Of course, it was hard, but um, it was for the best. You know, I am the type of person when something needs to get done, it just needs to get done. Hard or not hard, whatever. It was for the, I'm not going to have more autistic children. I can't, whatever. It was for the best. And based off your brother, he, like, he made a comment to you saying that, that you'll never fit in. Do you do you feel that that that's accurate? Do you think no. he's right, or do you no. think you're right? Of course not. Of course not. You should never think. You should never. Uh, oh no. You should never um, hold on to people's negative. Machine got like what? Why? Why? How does he know? Because he didn't fit in at at, at our great grandmother's uh, family. Does it mean that like every Hasidic person is like my great grandmother? How does he even know? You know, it's not a fact. It's 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 his opinion. It's not a fact. No, he, he can say whatever he wants. And, you know, he's nice and he's respectful. He respects it. He just said that. But there's no way that I would run with whatever he says or what anyone says in that matter. It, it, neg negative stuff. No, it's not. Uh, of course, I must say. You know, I am different and not everything is not always perfect wherever I walk. When I go to Mondo and I walk in the street, I do see people literally sticking their heads out of their windows, out of the doors, looking, and then just turn their heads inside, schmooze, and then more people look outside. You know, it's not nice, but they're curious. I would be curious probably too if I live in that bubble and I never see a person like myself. So um, it, it's not always perfect. But it's, it's, it's only fair for people to be curious. And the curiosity is not always negative either. They yeah. don't know. So mm -hmm. th th that's how those spark. Right. That's very open-minded of you. So like currently, <laughs> what's, what's your status now? Like, are, do you date? Are you looking to get married now? Well, I am looking to get married. Um, I'm not dating anyone at this very mo moment. Um, my mother really wants more Ina Cliff, like desperately more. Oh gosh, uh, desperately. She already has quite a few, but she just wants a baby again. Um, and I, of course, you know, I by me it goes through 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 Jewish matchmakers, 
Um, and my mother already had it. She's like, why won't you just go on Tinder or something? Like, get married <laughs> already. <laughs> so yeah, she's like that. But yeah, no, I I, I do want it to, I, I, I do want to um, uh, go by it. I wouldn't say the proper way, but just the way that it's safest for me. <laughs> I won't go on Tinder <laughs> looking for a husband. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, you'd probably be a very unique Tinder person <laughs> on there. Like your background, I, I don't know how many Hasidim are really on there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, but also you won't know who, who like, okay, who is this? You, you know, if you go to a Shatran, you at least get some background uh, and, 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 and uh, references and stuff like that. I need that. I have kids. I need that. I have to make sure if I get married now, that's a sham. It, it would be for the rest of my life. You know, I, I, I don't want to make, uh, I'm not going to say my ex-husband was a mistake, but I, I, my intention is really to just stay married for the rest of my life, not to have to get divorced again. Which which you deserve. You deserve to 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 find the the person that you're going to spend the rest of your life with. So I mean, it's challenging. I think somewhat to be to be a from person. We we are definitely a minority, but to be a minority within a minority is, you know, I can't even imagine. I mean, comparatively, like I, it's easy for me. I think to be a from person, but for you to choose to be a front person and plus on top of it, like you said, to be a person of color in that already niche yeah. probably comes with a lot of hardships, I'd imagine. Hardships in what way? Meaning the fact that like being being different and I'll just call that different, you know, like let's say being a front person in a world where there's not many from people. We're such a small percentage of the world. Yeah. It's just challenging. And, you know, like even for me, like I'm waving a lula an esrig and like people near me who are not Jewish, like what? <laughs> are, even even people who are Jewish are not religious. They're like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, it's just different. You know, you're wearing a yarmulke. I'm trying to explain to people you know, that I work with that aren't Jewish. Like, oh, I won't be available here. And then I'm trying to explain what Cholomoyd is. And they're like, what? What's <laughs> like... You can't, okay. ex it's very, you could, but it's very hard to explain it. Yeah. So whatever, I have those, me personally, I have those type of, or even the rise of anti-Semitism, there's a challenge, but I can imagine within the framework though, that I have, I still somewhat fit into the from community. You were saying that like, even so, unfortunately, you know, people are very accepting, but you still get pushback from ignorant or just, just closed minded or probably a lot of young children that just don't realize like what difference does the color of the skin make. Yeah. But I'm saying like that challenge of like being a minority within a minority. Yeah. There's probably a lot of hardship there. Yeah. Yeah. It is what you allow in. Um, sure. I, I, I get it a lot. And you know, the one thing though, when I walk outside in the street of, of New York City, where it is in Manhattan, Harlem, the Bronx, Queens, whatever, people don't necessarily right away see a Jewish woman, non-Jewish people, that is. They just see a, a black lady that's not from the United States or not from that area. Or that, that, that's always obvious to them, but nobody right away sees a Jewish woman unless I walk with my children, um, then yes. So... Um, the, 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 that makes it um, easier, I guess, um, first of all. But within the Jewish community itself, yes, of course, kids are extremely blunt. My, um, in, in my youngest son's camp, they called me the brown mama, which means the brown mommy. I, and I am brown, you know, so I mean, I don't, I, I am whatever. But my son was like, why is that such a, okay, so the just a pink mama? Like, what's this with days? Like, my, my son just didn't have why they would call me the brown mama. What's so interesting about it? Because he's exposed to a brown Jewish mother all day. So to him, it's normal. Um, but uh, even the kids, you know, as, as sometimes uh, clueless as they are and blunt as they are, I do even experience from them that they are very respectful. They always want to help. They always uh, smile and laugh and talk. And I always get that. And if I... Sometimes I speak for in, in, in girls' schools. They're so respectful. They just extremely respectful. They get up when you come in the room. There, I, I never. 
we, I mean, you can let the negativity get into you, but I, I, it's, I don't absorb neg negativity in the first place. I mean, as much as I can. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not made of a rock, but but. <laughs> What if Hashem, I, I, I do am able, I am able to just be strong and just to focus on the positivity and focus on um, 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 my true self and don't let other people's opinions and, and, and words get to me, negative opinions and negative words. So um, I, I, am, I am staying very true to myself, I should say, and, and, and that helps, I guess. I really like that because I do find that people break most often in life when they're not being who they feel that they really truly should be. Or right. like, I guess whatever, you're getting spiritual here, like whatever their real mission is in life. Yeah. Yeah. To fake it and be someone else, that's very hard. It's it's a character. Okay. You got to like play. Yeah. You have to act. Yeah. But when you're yourself, it's a lot harder to get be brought down because you're like, it doesn't make a difference what you think. It's what Hashem thinks. And and he thinks I'm supposed to be like this, and that's how I'm going to be. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, and th and that's what I have because I also I all I often also get the question from children also. Are you Jewish? Are you Jewish? Are you Jewish? Are you Jewish? Um, and of course they ask me because I don't look Jewish. Yeah. So, uh, but it's, uh, whatever. And I ask, Are you Jewish? Are you Jewish? <laughs> and then they're like, Yeah, I have tips. So of course I have a couple of. Then they answer those types of things. But I mean, yeah, it doesn't bother me. I just usually turn the questions back around to kind of um, let them face what they're asking me and how really, how stupid that really is. Because why do you ask me, am I Jewish? While you feel like it's very obvious for you that you are Jewish, so yeah. Yeah, no, I hear that. It's also like, it's funny because like there's been a few times where now I'm walking down the street and like someone not Jewish asked me like, what are those? And like pointing to my tzitzis yeah. and I'm like, oh, they're tzitzis. And like, she's like, why do you wear them? And like, it gets me into the mode of like, wait, hold on. Why do I wear it? And like, I have to be like, well, it's going to remind me of the water and then the water, the sky. And that reminds me Hashem is there and 613. And I'm like, those kind of questions that I, you're flipping back on these kids or just really anyone, I think at least from someone from me who's like born, you know, Orthodox from age zero, we kind of take for granted the system that we're in. And, you know, even if it's like my mission in life, like I sometimes we go through it and we don't really think, wait, 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 why are we doing yeah. this? Like, okay, maybe you heard, but like, how does that really relate to you? Yes. Um, and I love that you kind of flip it back on them because just how they're asking you and again, maybe ignorant and okay, it's a fair question. It's just as fear for you to say like, wait, what makes you Jewish, yeah. you know? <laughs> yes. And it's my, my kids actually, especially my oldest son, he really does so because, because of what you said, it just reminds me, he really does always want to know why we have to do everything that we do. Um, now, of course he knows, but he always, he, he doesn't do anything that's just random. He always wants to know why do we have to wash hands before uh, making a noise? Why do he wants to know everything he, and, and so ehrlich also like so honest about everything then if something doesn't feel true to him then he's very expressive about it also which i'm happy about because i want my kids to be able to talk to me and, and express to me um if something is uncomfortable or very comfortable or whatever so um but yeah my oldest son it happens to be one of those children who does really wants to know everything, um, every tradition that we have and why and who and what and that. Sometimes he asks questions about Toyota, like, did this really happen? Did the Ibish to really split the sea so that we could pass through? And then, yeah, I, I say, yeah. Or sometimes I say like, well, I wasn't there. I don't know. Probably it says in the Toyota, so, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he really wants to know everything and just to make sure like doesn't make sense he wants to make sense of everything yeah <laughs> we'll be right back to this week's episode but first i would love for you all to know about two things that are close to my heart first off i need you to hear this i'm going to play something into the mic so you'll hear it this is good faith effort with ari lamb 
And here's your host, Rabbi Dr. Ari Lamb. I'll get to my point, what, what I'm showing hello, you. Hello, hello, and welcome to Good Faith Effort, the world's most dangerous Bible podcast, the podcast where we show you how the values and ideas of the Bible can illuminate the most important conversations in society, from politics to pop culture and beyond. And today, Good Faith Fam, I am just beyond excited about today's guest, one of the most legendary Bible educators in my own Jewish community since literally 1985, but who's also been constantly innovating from his writings to podcasting, and who on top of all of that is the author of the phenomenal Between the Lines of the Bible commentaries. He's Rabbi Yitzchak Et Shalom, and we're going to talk about techniques for reading biblical literature, which of course... Okay, you, you get a point. Um, every podcast is really rooted on the host. Hopefully you like me as a host. I, I I literally get chizik and inspiration um, from the Good Faith Efforts hosts. Um, he he's incredible. He, he for Rabbi Doctor, I mean that's a lot more than me. Little old, I'm not even a Mister. I feel like a child. But um, he brings on. They bring on Good Faith Effort brings on incredible guests each week, and it's so diverse. And it talks about how we could use the Bible, how we use the Chumash to really help us live a better life and how we can use it to teach America real values. And listen, it's from God. So he brings on people like David Fred, David French. Um, and, you know, I'm just going to, I've read to you a few people, but I'm going to go like way down the list. He has Russ Roberts talking from the Bible to Hayek, Scott Shaye, finance and faith. Ooh, maybe a kosher money crossover. Got Ethan Strauss, sports society and being a normal person. Judy Hyman, disability. Jeremy Dower, comedy in America and brian johnson religion crime and prisons the point is he has the most diverse guests possible with topics that are so different and so powerful to give you an understanding of how to use the bible i mean he, he even does like these amazing tweets of like why it's important to read the bible in hebrew you have to check him out on twitter um it's incredible i highly highly recommend the good faith of our podcast go listen to them on spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts. And now, let me tell you about the Simcha Time revolution. Basically, you could go to simchatime.org and submit the chesed that you did. That's nice. We all do charity and kindness and spread happiness and make people happy and feel the Simcha. But here's why Simcha Time is a little different. It's a memory of someone named Simcha Beryl Dove and Avram Moshe who went out of his way every single day at any moment to go and help another person. We grow as human beings and as a society when we go out and help others. So we have so many opportunities in our lives. Yes, when it's easy for us, of course, we, we, we take the opportunity. Who would want to do something good? But the goal is to go out of our way and to do an act of kindness that is, is honestly annoying. It's annoying for us to do, but enough that we're like, you know what? This is going to change someone's day. Because we change someone's day, you change their week, you change their week, you change their month, you change the month, you change the year, you change the year, you change their 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 Yovel. You change their Yovel, you change their life. And that's what uh, Simcha Time is truly about. So go ahead and do the chesed, do the kindness to someone else, and don't stop there. Go ahead by your Shabbos table and go around the table and do and talk about the kindness that you did and brag about it. Be braggadocious, T for it, and tell people about it. Why? Why is that so important? Because that will help encourage others to go and do it. And you know what? You should feel proud about it. It doesn't mean that you should do a bunch of simple times throughout the week. You don't have to say every single time, but choose one. Choose one moment that you want to share with others and encourage others to do kindness. We know this world was built on three pillars. One of them was kindness. And we are encouraging you to go ahead and do simple time. It's free. It's simple. It's easy. And you will be supporting the world. Now, back to this week's episode. Out of the 630 mitzvahs that we have, is there one mitzvah in particular that you personally gravitate a little more towards or it makes you feel a little more connected than the others? No, not necessarily, actually. <clears throat> in, 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 if I think about it, I, I feel like sometimes I do mitzvahs all day without bragging at, at all. It, it's, it's just my nature, I guess. I work also in a school merely for the sake of children uh, to, to contribute to their, how do you say, ontwikkeling, to their uh, development, make sure that they become 
um, good developed Yiddish kinder, you know. I, I always looking how I could help somebody to to elevate them in whatever way. Um, I I don't know why, but no. I, if if I have to think about a specific mitzvah, not really. I I I just always want to do good by myself and 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 by others, especially children. If there was one person from history, or one person who's no longer with us, that you could spend an hour with, who would you spend the hour with, and what would you discuss? Ooh, um, I would say Rachel, Rachel, Rachel from the from the Torah. And why is <laughs> because she rem- I she reminds me a lot of myself, um, um, her resilience, her her. I I feel like she could teach me. She could teach me a lot um, about myself. She could wake things in me that I did not knew about myself just by talking to her. <laughs> okay, that's a good answer. I like you that. You do. <laughs> Yeah, I meant to, to sit down with Rachel. That's that's a good. That's a very nice answer. Oh, um, yeah. Is there is there one story that either happened in your life or that you've heard that really gives you chizik, that really inspires you? If there's something that happened in my life that really inspired me, yeah, there is there there are many, but a really profound thing that really through my whole life upside down is really the last time that I saw my great grandmother really if I think about it even though sorry what did you wanted to ask no I was gonna say it's wild that like you had such a like it was such a I guess negative experience that you had with her and then the last yeah. thing that she did really empowered you yeah like you said that is kind of interesting and even though back then when she spoke to me, it really didn't mean anything to me, whatever she said. I just wanted to go and continue to play. And I didn't want her to touch me or anything. Still, it, it, it still woke something up, you know? It still did something to me. Um, and, and if it wasn't perhaps for that, I would not really know who I truly was the way I do now. Then it would be a sense of mm, I feel attracted to this specific community, but not really being able to place myself completely the way I can now. What's the either best advice you've ever received or the worst advice, or both? The best advice I ever received was definitely that of my mother, of course. They throw to yourself. Whether you're, you're a Heimish or not, just stay through to yourself. Really, that's really what I do. And that's really the best thing anyone can do. And the worst advice that I got was to not to get too close to uh, Hasid, uh, the Hasidic community. Because they're racist, they're not nice, they're this, they that, they're... Yeah, that, that would be the worst advice because I feel like when I am uh, with my people in, in the Hasidic community, especially on Shabbosimo or Yom Toim, that's really when I feel so herlich, you know, so uh, amazing, so settled. That's to be the best way to describe it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. For, for the outside world, someone maybe who's not Jewish, who doesn't really know much about Hasidim, what 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 would you want them to know about Hasidim? Whether they don't have any really image of them, or maybe they have a negative connotation. What, what do you well, want to know? First them to of know all, about Hasidim? that first of all, that Hasidic people are really just like any other person. Hasidic people, they're not all the same. They all have their own minds. They're all senses of humor. They're all do's and don'ts. They're all wants and needs. One is very happy and outgoing and social. Other ones are not. They're all really individuals at first of all. Because many people think all Hasimah are the same. And that's really not true. They, they all really have personalities, individual personalities. That one. And two, just to be a little bit more open-minded, you know. Just to be a little bit more open-minded. I am probably as black as a black person maybe can be. 
And I really treat it always with kindness, with kindness and with respect. Really, I am. I always get beautiful vishlagmonas from Fopiren, from 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 Hasidic people. They didn't have to do it. I'm I'm I'm, I'm always treated very nicely. I'm always invited. They, they're not. I'm sure there's some racists out there, of course, like every other community has racists, sure, you know, but not all of them are racist and not all of them are mean. And, and just to really just be open-minded and not to just always believe everything you hear and, 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 and you read. Before I ask my last question, I just want to discuss um, th the fact that you wrote a book and and it's it's selling like hotcakes off the shelves and if anyone wants to buy it we have a link in the show notes and i highly recommend everyone go out and read it because we just scratched the surface <laughs> i feel like with this interview there's so many gems and it's a really incredible story your story but like what what prompted you to write the book at this point um a few reasons one uh well since i'm 18 i always heard you should really write a book you should really write a book that's something people always told me Whatever. I, I, I never did it As until three years ago. I started writing. So, because I guess, you know, my background is very unusual. And just to tell my interesting background to the world, that's, that's one of the reasons. And the other reason is really to, because obviously most people have a, a certain view of what a citizenship person is, what a citizenship person looks like and, and behaves like and whatnot. And that there are other type of Hasidic people out there, like myself. We exist. I'm not the only black Hasidic lady. I'm not. Uh, and, and this is my story. And, and just to, to, you know, kind of show that there is a diversity um, among us. Could you talk to the audience? Could you talk to someone who's listening or watching this, this mm -hmm. episode that's going through their own challenges and uh, based off of your own advice, what would you give them to help them get to just get out of the challenge or move what through the challenge? What kind of challenge would that be? I think everyone goes through their own challenges. It's, it's I'm, I'm making it very broad, right. so you could talk to, on a broad sta uh, stand. But uh, okay, up well, to you. really, the advice that I would give to anyone, which is the best advice that I've ever received. It's just to please stay true to yourself. This is not maybe a good thing that I'm saying it, but many people do things to please other people. It is very important to really be true to yourself. If you do something, do it because you feel like you have to do it, not because of what others expect from you. Marry the person that you like, you know, do it. Just stay true to yourself. Don't do things because of outside sources, but it doesn't connect with you. It's very important. If you are true to yourself, you'll be the happiest person. I mean, if, if, if you can, not everybody could, I guess. But if you have the opportunity, yeah, that, that, that's definitely my, uh, my advice, just to really stay true to yourself. And if you're just really still... I just I put your head on autopilot and just let it all come over you. You can sense what is what is what sits well with you and what does not sit well with you. And I'm not talking about comfortable and uncomfortable. You have to do uncomfortable things in life. Not, life is just not always comfortable. But I'm talking about what do you want? What is it that you want with your life, for your life, for yourself? You know, things like that. Really figure that out really figure it out it's very important every person jewish non-jewish very important to figure out for yourself what is it that you want what are you good at what makes you happy are you happy what is it that makes you happy what do you have to do in order to become happy and that's another thing some people don't even know what they want yeah so it's 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 very important to figure these things out but it it really it it, it sometimes takes years it, it sometimes really does but that's my advice. <laughs> As you're saying your advice, which I think is excellent advice, um, it just popped into my head. It's such a silly question, but I'm so curious. You know, being that you're not uh, from a from background, and now you're Hasidish, 
Is there a food that you're like, the world needs to know about this food? By us or? or? Yeah, by, by Hasidim. Oh, potato kegel. Potato kegel. Add a plus potato kegel. <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I'm always curious of like potato kegel, chalent. I'm like, why? Like, I get it. It's like a weird food if you don't know what it is. But I really believe like if they sold it in like one of these stores <laughs> in Manhattan, to everyone and they yeah. marketed it well like i think non-jews would be like yeah, this is exactly, actually really good exactly yes no potato kugel especially overnight just 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 overnight gives it a lot more flavors that's really something if you haven't tried it go to a jewish uh, deli whatever uh or takeout whatever you call it and just buy a piece of potato kugel try it you will love it that that's one dish i do think should be indeed <laughs> sold all over the world <laughs> Yeah. Amazing, amazing. If someone wants to get in touch with you, whether to speak, I know you go around, you speak um, in schools, shuls, uh, where's the best place to find you that people can reach out? Um, that, that Well, actually, I have somebody that goes, that answers my emails, and, 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 and but you can best contact me through her. Her name is Yael, and that's um, through um, email address team Sarah Braun at gmail.com. Okay, amazing. We'll put that in the show notes as well. Suri, thank you Imagine. so much for taking your time to do this interview. I, I really enjoyed getting to know you. And like I said, anyone who who enjoyed this, they're really going to enjoy your book. It's It's fantastic. And I highly, highly recommend it. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this week's podcast. If you didn't see Frida's interview with Suri yet, go ahead and check that out. That's linked below. And if you didn't buy her book, if you didn't buy Sarah Braun's book, Suri's book, go ahead and buy it. There's This This is, is such a little taste of her incredible journey. And I even after the interview, we realized mutually we know people. We're also connected in the world. And um, if anyone is watching this on YouTube to this point, or you want to comment on Spotify, just comment the word EPIC, E-P-I-C, four letters. It helps us. I'm not sure why, but it helps the algorithm. So go ahead and and use that code word so I can know that you watched the full video. And don't, I know, I know, I know you're watching now. You're like, ah, I'm not going to do it. Do it. Go ahead and do it. And also go ahead and please, please, um, support our sponsors our advertisers go ahead and subscribe and listen to the wonderful good faith effort podcast go ahead and go to simplatime.org to submit the chesed that you did and, and actually do it do charity do chesed do kindness do simcha for other people and go ahead and go to our friends at masika satora and you could give their phone number a call to donate money um or you could go to their website their number is 732-800-9099 and masikasatora.org in the show notes you'll have links to all of these and um go ahead and support our advertisers really really incredible i'm actually learning for for just straight with no interrupt it's it's really beautiful if you enjoyed this episode, go ahead and share this with someone that you think will get inspired from Suri and her story. I think so often that we have people in our lives that are just going through their lives and they could always use the extra chizik and inspiration and um, I'm getting distracted from the other room because there's a lot of noise, but go ahead and share this episode. And um, until next time, keep on being inspiration. Living L'chaim.